Welcome back. So this is part three in a series of using desktop Linux amongst other tech ecosystems. So far, we have covered the Microsoft ecosystem, the Google ecosystem, and today we're taking a slight detour through the walled garden that is the Apple world. Now, Apple is an interesting one, and I have an interesting relationship with Apple, Mac OS, iOS, and Apple devices in general. Quick story, way back when I was a teenager around the release of Mac OS X Leopard with the wallpaper that looks like this, this was the release of Mac OS that actually convinced me to ditch Windows and start looking for an alternative operating system, which led me to Linux. And then here we are today. Now, the funny thing is, is that because Linux and Mac OS do kind of share on some level, some technical underpinnings, there seems to be quite a bit of overlap between the two camps. If you are experienced on Mac OS, you probably could be pretty good with Linux. Now the question is though, if you are dabbling in both worlds, it is notoriously difficult to get these things working and get a Linux desktop talking with a Mac OS, Apple or iOS ecosystem. So what I'm going to attempt to do today is try to bridge that gap a little bit. So there'll be time codes down below. You can skip to the chapters that you find most relevant. I did actually end up buying a 2020 M1 MacBook Air. It's because I am fascinated by the hardware and technological innovation that has gone into these new chip architectures. So let's dive in. We'll see what we can find out today. Today's episode is sponsored by MeisterTask. If you clicked on this video, the chances are that you like using tech to be productive. Now, MeisterTask is a very easy to use, intuitive and really well designed collaboration tool for task and project management in a very Kanban style task management, which most of you I'm sure are familiar with. With a customizable dashboard to fit your needs, you can have your tasks, projects, notifications, team, and all of that stuff right where you want it. And visually, it's really laid out beautifully and intuitively in that glanceability of all of this information is very important when you're managing a team and managing projects across remotely or across an office or wherever it may be. And the fact that MeisterTask has these things delineated very clearly, very simply, and beautifully actually makes you want to hop in here and check what's going on, check the notifications and make sure that your team is up to date. And I think that's what this particular tool has over some of its competitors. Now, not only that, but MeisterTask has a bunch of different integrations with all of the services that you might already be using around the workplace so that you can make it adapt to your needs and not vice versa. So make the best out of your project management with MeisterTask and you can enhance your and your team's productivity easily. Check out the link in the description and hit that link to trial out MeisterTask for yourself and your team, as well as a 15% discount on MeisterTask Pro or Business. So once again, try it out at the link below and thanks again to MeisterTask for sponsoring today's episode. Okay, so first of all, starting off once again, Zorin OS 16 is the base that I'm using here. It's a GNOME based desktop. I just think it's very clean and it works well. Uh, your mileage may vary, so feel free to insert whatever Linux desktop you might be using. I think most of these things will still apply. Okay, first of all, we need to figure out how we're gonna access iCloud iCloud is obviously kind of the cloud-based backbone of a lot of the Apple ecosystem nowadays. And the good news is, is that thankfully, Apple's web-based tools for accessing iCloud and its related services, things like photos, drive, mail, notes, reminders, calendar, all of that kind of stuff are all relatively easy to get to from a web page. However, uh, you can actually go ahead and install some Snap application versions of some of these things. Now, Marcus Tomlinson has packaged up some electron based wrappers for some of these web services so that you can have nice, pretty little icons sitting in your, uh, basically in your app menus. And while these launches do work relatively well, what I've noticed is that the simple ones like uh, Apple Notes and reminders and find my iPhone and that kind of thing work quite well within those electron wrapper windows. Some of the more complicated ones like pages, numbers and keynote uh, don't seem to work too well or like the browser that is uh, embedded into those uh, web wrapper windows. The good news is, is that these services do actually work quite nicely in a web browser. All you need to do is to be able to have two factor authentication with either another iOS 
15 or greater device or a macOS device and you should be able to access your iCloud account from a web browser and that rolls in all the services that you can see here. Now, unfortunately, that does mean that actually accessing the native iCloud drive files off your iCloud and into another cloud syncing or cloud storage option becomes mandatory because there is no simple way to be able to access the local files in your iCloud drive on desktop Linux. It, uh, it might be possible, but from the digging around that I can find, at least at this point, without involving a third party cloud syncing client, iCloud Drive seems fairly off limits. So what I'd suggest you do is go out and uh, check out something like pCloud. Uh, pCloud is a fantastic alternative to uh, the iCloud level of privacy and security that uh, that Apple users are used to and they do have quite competitive pricing I think as well as uh, clients for Windows Mac and Linux and it's just a much better cross-platform solution overall. Moving on from that though once you are able to access the stuff in your iCloud uh, in your iCloud library and including things like notes and reminders and calendars, it's now time to try and integrate some of those things into the desktop itself. So when it comes to accessing your iCloud email on Linux, it's a fairly straightforward process as it would be if you were setting it up through anything else. So you pick your email client of choice. Um, most of the time in this series, I've been recommending Evolution as the email client to use, but honestly, you could use Thunderbird or uh, Mailspring or whatever, it, uh, whatever your preference is. And what I would suggest is that uh, definitely go into your iCloud settings. So you'll need to go to your Apple ID account page and in the security section, you want to generate a password for app specific passwords. Now, what this will allow you to do is it will allow you to create up to 25 uh, external logins into your iCloud account. That means for every email client or every calendar or anything like that, that you want to set up and allow third party access to your Apple stuff, then you'll need to make sure that you have set up app specific passwords. Now this is where a lot of people come undone because they just go straight to the IMAP settings and then they wonder why their mail won't synchronize with Thunderbird or any other email client. This is the missing step. You need to generate an app specific password. Beyond that, it's pretty simple in terms of just adding the classic uh, IMAP server stuff and you should be away for accessing your email. Now, a similar thing also applies for accessing your calendar in that you will need to enable those application specific passwords for CalDAV in your, um, in your iCloud settings. And then that will allow you to come into your calendar and to add a CalDAV account in your online account section or by accessing your calendar app of choice. In my case, I'm just using the default GNOME calendar app and you can access or add a calendar by importing it through the CalDAV settings. Okay, so that takes care of email and calendar on your Linux desktop. Now, what about iMessage? This one is a real pain point, as is a common theme across the Linux desktop when it comes to integrating into the Apple ecosystem. But if you have some spare hardware lying around and a little bit of time to invest in a solution that is a little bit workaroundy and may disappear but has been around for a little while, Blue Bubbles is my recommendation for you. It's an open source tool that basically sets up a like an iMessage relay server on a piece of hardware that you might have sitting around. Now, uh, yeah, it is a bit of work, but if you are able to get it set up and follow their installation instructions that are fairly straightforward, you can not only access iMessage on Android, but you can also access it through a native Windows or Linux client, which I think is pretty swell. Uh, it does, it is predicated on you having a Mac OS enabled device hanging around. So maybe it's a Mac mini or an old MacBook Air or whatever it is. It basically needs to run a minimal uh, server installation on a macOS device, but once that's enabled and running, then you are able to uh, basically relay those messages on like really well, really quickly to uh, Android, Linux, Windows, whatever. And you get basically feature parity with proper iMessage. Now, I don't, I don't know like the legalities of all of this. So your mileage may vary and I uh, guess use with caution. It's a little bit hacky, but I thought it was a cool way of being able to use iMessage uh, on Linux. Okay, moving on from there though, let's talk about FaceTime because FaceTime recently had an update where you could using an iOS device or a Mac OS device, you could create a link 
for other devices that are not Apple devices to join a FaceTime call through a web browser. So that opens up a world of possibilities with iOS 15, where it will allow you to send a link either to yourself or to others uh, on a Linux desktop or otherwise, and join in a FaceTime call with their own mic and webcam on any device they might be on. So great time for the Linux world. If you are trying to join in on the FaceTime conversations with friends and family, they can simply send you a link and away you go. So that's kind of nice. Now, if we consider what it is, uh, one of the big boons of the Apple ecosystem is uh, AirDrop being able to wirelessly transfer files. Snapdrop is something that I've been recommending for quite some time as an alternative to AirDrop. And basically when you have an AirDrop, uh, when you get used to having AirDrop around, you definitely miss it when it's gone. Now Snapdrop aims to be basically a website that you can go to. And as long as you are on the same localized Wi-Fi, uh, it will be able to pick up the other clients in the area and you'll be able to click on that client, send it a file, and it will appear on the iOS device and you can receive it from there. Now, vice versa should also work, but you need to make sure that on the iOS device you're wanting to send files from that you actually have given it permission to access the files on your phone. And Apple devices are quite uh, permissions heavy nowadays as are a lot of apps. So that is also worth looking into if you wanna be able to wirelessly transfer files between either Mac OS and a Linux desktop or a Linux desktop and an iOS device. Uh, the more you know. Finally, let's talk about KDE Connect because if you watch my last video, I had a little bit of a nugget at the end there where KDE Connect is finally coming to iOS and it is in an early version available on iOS 15 and later. Uh, and it's currently in the beta phase. So it's on TestLink, you have to sign up through that process, but you can get quite a few of the features that have been known for KDE Connect users for some time. Uh, on iOS, which is really sick. Definitely go and do some reading to see what is uh, compatible and what isn't at this stage. And uh, yeah, if you're interested, definitely go and see how you can help that project out because KDE Connect is all kinds of awesome. Things like clipboard sharing, uh, sending and receiving remote files and using your phone as a remote control for your Linux desktop are all features that I believe are currently implemented and they are being tested and they're wanting to add more features to that down the track. Uh, finally, on the entertainment front, using uh, Apple Music or Apple TV Plus is also very compatible with basic web browsers, which is great to know. So just going to music.apple.com and logging in with your Apple device will enable you to listen to all the playlists that you might have through Apple Music, which is great, provided that you enable DRM in Firefox and other browsers. And it also does give you the ability to preview different playlists and tracks through the web browser as well, which is quite nice. Same goes for Apple TV Plus. As long as you can enable the DRM in the browser that you're using, you'll be able to stream those shows if you are a paying subscriber there. Now there's obviously a bunch of stuff that we just can't do with uh, Apple and iOS devices in general. One of the biggest frustrations for me personally is being able to export a lot of the data that I have buried in some of these iOS apps like Notes, for example, and be able to export that in a meaningful way to a different, more compatible app, such as Simple Note. But that's where my advice would kind of be to, if you can at all possible, use services that are more cross compatible than just the ones that come built into Apple's ecosystem. While there are a lot of great third party alternatives out there, the more effort that you put into migrate into third party services that integrate well across different platforms, the easier it is and, uh, and the more flexible you can be with what platforms you use. So for me personally, I have used Simple Note for quite a few years now and Apple Notes became, uh, even though it's incredibly powerful and it's very useful, the combination of either Simple Notes or Joplin and other note taking software has kind of taken the place of Apple Notes uh, for me. So hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, uh, leave a comment down below. Let me know what is the most frustrating thing about the Apple ecosystem for you. Now, for me, it's a very real temptation uh, and it is a very real thing that I'm jumping between Linux, Windows and Mac OS all the time. And, uh, and the recent acquisition of this M1 MacBook Air has only solidified that because of just how stinking awesome the, uh, the new M1 chips and all the chips that they're based off, just how awesome they are. So looking forward to seeing how Linux can integrate onto that hardware platform in the future. But until now, hopefully these tips will help you out integrating and bridging the gap between these two tech ecosystems. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all in the next one.